Because the, the world doesn't allow you to, it'll, it will be because you don't uh, allow yourself to. So I have one little suggestion for you. Pick out the person in the class that you admire the most, and then write down why you admire them. Put down a list of qualities. Uh, you're not to name yourself in this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then put down the, the one uh, uh, that, frankly, you could stand the least in the whole group. And put, the, put down the qualities that, uh, that uh, uh, turn you off in that person. And look at that list, and, and you won't find it's a bunch of things like throwing a football 70 yards or, you know, or anything of the sort. The qualities of the first one that you admire are qualities that, that uh, you, with a little practice, uh, can make your own, and which, if practiced, will become habit-forming. The chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. I mean, my age, I can't change any of my habits. I mean, I'm stuck. But at your age, you know, you will have the habits 20 years from now that you decide to put into practice uh, today. So I just suggest that, that you, you look at the habits you admire in others, or the behavior you admire in others, and, and make those your own uh, habits. And you look at, at what you really find uh, uh, somewhat reprehensible in others, and just decide, you know, that those are things you're not going to do. Ben Franklin did that a few hundred years ago, and it still works today. And if, if you do that, uh, you'll find that uh, you convert all your horsepower into output. So with that sermon, I'll let Bill give you another one, and then we'll get into your questions. Yeah. <laughs> get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over. But get it right was number one. I mean, you have to have your facts right, because if you go out with the wrong facts, you get killed, and you can't redo it afterwards. And, uh, but that does mean sometimes some delay. You have to gather information from within your own organization, and you are on the defensive. I, I, would not, I do not hold against Goldman at all the fact that an allegation has been made by the SEC, and if, if it leads into something more serious, you know, then, then we'll look at the situation that time. But but what I've seen in terms of the abacus uh, uh, activity, I, I, I just don't, I, I do not see that that would be any different than me complaining about the list of municipals that were given to me to ensure uh, a couple of years ago. Charlie? Well, I, I agree with all of that. But I also think that every business ought to decline a lot of business that's perfectly legal and proper to accept. In other words, the standards in business should not be what's legal and convenient. The standards should be different. And I don't think there's an investment bank in America of any consequence that didn't take too many SCSI customers and deal in too many SCSI securities. I, w I would agree with that, but Charlie would. Do you think we should have done our municipal bond deal? For, uh, I think it was a closer case than you do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we insure probably 40 billion now or something like that of municipal bonds. And we have done very little in the last year, uh, not because of Charlie's views that he just expressed, but because, basically because the, the, the price isn't right, the premiums are wrong, and the reaction of other people when premiums are wrong is to take more risk. And the, our reaction when premiums are wrong is just to go play golf or something and tell somebody to call us when premiums get right again. Well, you've got to understand accounting. Uh, you've got to, uh, that's got to be like a language to you. And uh, so, yeah, you have to know what you're reading. I mean, and, and, and unless you know that language, and, and and some people have more aptitude for that than others. I, I know, but, uh, and that's one thing I learned by myself. Now I took courses in it afterwards, for example, but I, but I learned it myself in it, largely. Uh, so you have to do that, and you have to have the attitude that you're buying part of a business, and not that you're buying something that wiggles around on a chart or that has resistance zones or 200-day moving averages or that you buy puts or calls on or anything like that. You're buying part of a business. And if you buy intelligently into a business, you're going to make money. The approach that I think I'm using now of trying to search out businesses that where I think they're selling at the lowest price relative to the discounted cash they would produce in the future, but 
if I were working with a small amount of money, the universe would be huge compared to the universe of possible ideas I work with now. You mentioned that 56 to 69 was the best period. Actually, my best period was before that. It was from right after I met Ben Graham in 19, early 1951. But from the end of 1950 through the next 10 years, actually returns averaged about 50% a year. And they, I think they were 37 points better than the Dow per year, something like that. But that I was working with a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of money. And so I would pour through volumes of, of, of businesses and I would find one or two that I could put $10,000 into or $15,000 into that were just ridiculous, they were ridiculously cheap. And obviously, as the money increased, uh, the, the universe of possible ideas started shrinking dramatically. The times were also better for doing it in that time. But I, I think that, I think if you're working with a small amount of money, with exactly the same background that Charlie and I have, and same ideas, same, same whatever ability we have, you know, I think you can make very significant sums. But you, but as soon as you start getting the money up into the millions, many millions, the, the, the curve on expectable results falls off just dramatically. Uh, but that's, that's the nature of it. it you've got to, you know, when, you've, you, when you get up to things you can put millions of dollars into, you've got a lot of competition looking at that, and they're not looking as I did when I started. When I started, I went through the pages of the manuals page by page. I mean, I probably went through 20,000 pages. Uh, in the Moody's Industrial Transportation Banks and Finance manuals, and I did it twice, and I actually, you know, looked at every business. I didn't look very hard at some. Well, that's not a practical way to invest tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so I would say, if you're working with a small sum of money, uh, that, and you're really interested in in the, in the business and willing to do the work, you can, you will find something. If you were, I, you, there's no question about it in my mind. You will find some things that promise very large returns compared to what we will be able to uh, uh, deliver uh, with large sums of money. Charlie? Well, yeah, I think that's right. A, a brilliant man who can't get any money from other people and is working with a very small sum probably should work in very obscure stocks, searching out uh, unusual mispriced opportunities. You know, you could, that's such a small world. It may be a way for one person to come up, but it's a, it's a long slog. Yeah, most smart people, unfortunately, in Wall Street figure that they can make a lot more money, a lot easier, just by uh, one way or another, you know, uh, getting an override on other people's money or, 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 uh, uh, delivering services in some way that people, and, and the monetization of hope and greed, you know, is a way to make a huge amount of money. Uh, and right now it's very, just take hedge funds. I mean, it's, I, I've had calls from a couple of friends in the last month that don't know anything about that investing money. They've been unsuccessful and everything else. And, you know, one of them called me the other day and said, well, I'm forming a small hedge fund, 125 million he was talking about. And, you know, like the thought that since it was only 125 million, maybe we ought to put in 10 million or something of the sort. I mean, if you looked at this fellow's Schedule D on his 1040 for the last 20 years, you know, you'd think he ought to be mowing lawns. But, yeah. but he may get his 125 million. I mean, you know, and it's, it's just astounding to me how willing people are during a bull market just to just to toss money around because they you know they think it's easy and and of course that's that's what they felt, felt about internet stocks a few years ago they'll think about something else next year too but uh the the biggest money made you know in, in wall street in recent years has not been made by great performance, but it's been by, by been made by great promotion, basically. Yeah, you'd have already looked at where it was located and the contract that it had with the suppliers and made a decision on competition. Uh, people, because they can make decisions every second in stocks, whereas they can't with farms, 
they think an investment in stocks is different than an investment in a business or an investment in a farm or an investment in an apartment house, uh, but it isn't. It, if, if you get your money's worth in terms of future earning power over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, you're going to have made a good investment, and you can't pick them from day to day. If you can do that, you can, well, I haven't met anybody yet that, that knows how to do it. You, you made a point of that in a letter this year where you highlighted a book that was written by Edgar Lawrence Smith back in 1924. And you said until he came along, nobody really realized the compound interest effect of buying stocks, not just buying businesses, but buying stocks themselves. Yeah. Edgar Lawrence Smith changed the world with that book, and the people have forgotten all about it now. Although in the 1920s, it, would, it became more and more gospel as the boom went on. But Edgar Lawrence Smith set out to write a book on bonds versus stocks. And he said if he went in with the idea that bonds would be a better investment in times of deflation and stocks would be a better uh, investment in times of inflation. And the first line of his book was to say that he'd been wrong. But he had enough sense to look at his evidence. I, mean, I think Darwin said if you found evidence that was contrary to what you already believed, write it down in 30 minutes or your, your mind will just block it out. I mean, people have a great resistance to new evidence. And he said if a stock yields 4 percent and a bond yields 4 percent, which was what he was talking about then, the stock was going to outperform the bonds because there were retained earnings that were building beyond that yield. And that's, that had been true for a long, long time, but nobody paid any attention to it. Uh, we don't get rich on our dividends that we receive, although we're happy to receive them. We get rich on, on, on the fact that the retained earnings are used to build new earning power, repurchase uh, shares, which increases your ownership in the company. And, and, uh, uh, and, and Berkshire has retained earnings ever since we started. That's the only reason Berkshire is worth a lot more as we retain earnings. That, that, that led... Keynes to actually say that this was an important book. People paid attention to it, but you're right. It added to the frenzy that built up to 1929. Well, that, that is true because you can get, uh, old boss Ben Graham told me very early on, you get more trouble with a good idea than a bad idea because the good idea works. I mean, it's a good idea to buy a home, for example, and then people go crazy. Sometimes. The good idea works and it works and it works. Stocks work out better than bonds most of the time. And after a while, people forget that there were some other limiting conditions. With Edgar Lawrence Smith's book, it was that when bonds yield the same as stocks, which was the case then, that stocks are going to outperform because they have this retained earnings. So stocks started going up in the 20s, and all of a sudden they were selling at five or six times the prices as when he bought the book. And the original correct uh, perception on his part had experienced changing conditions, but People just looked, they, they got their confirmation through stock prices. And people, that's what happens in bull markets. People, people start out thinking stocks are cheap, and then they start thinking stocks have gone up. <laughs> and, and a stock can be a good buy or a bad buy. A bond can be a good buy or a bad buy. It depends on price. But that leads us to today. I mean, if his premise was that stocks are always going to be a better, uh, a better investment than bonds, that's kind of what you hear today, which we've been hearing for a while, is, Tina, there is no alternative, right? You have to buy stocks because bond yields are so low, because interest rates are so low. Well, if, if you look at the present situation, we've talked about this before, that you get more for your money in stocks than bonds. That doesn't have to be the case. I mean, uh, uh, but it's usually been the case in, in America, very usually been the case. And, and if you buy a... 30-year bond today with a yield 2 percent, you're paying 50 times earnings for an investment where the earnings can't go up for 30 years. Now, if somebody said, I want to sell you a stock that's at 50 times earnings and the earnings can't go up for 30 years, you'd say, that doesn't sound very good. Stocks are way better than 30-year bonds. I mean, it's, 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 it, that's clear. And, and that's one of the alternatives people have. People really have three basic alternatives, short-term cash, which is an option of doing something later on, long-term bonds or, or, or long-term stocks, and stocks are cheaper than bonds. Charlie said recently, Charlie Munger, the vice chairman at Berkshire Hathaway, had his daily journal meeting just a couple of weeks ago, and at that meeting he said that there's a lot of wretched excess out there and that there's a lot of trouble coming as a result. Do you agree with that? There's always trouble coming. Yeah, there was trouble coming in 1942 when I bought that first stock, all kinds of trouble. Philippines were going to fall pretty soon. I'm never, uh, uh, there's all kinds of trouble in 
1949. There was trouble, uh, certainly trouble in 2008 when I wrote an article for the New York Times. I said trouble is coming, but I said buy stocks. <laughs> <laughs>